All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming and sitting down. Um, so I was asked to talk about uh, pediatric uh, care for patients with, for children with uh, hemorrhagic shock. Um, but I'm going to start the, the presentation with, uh, with my experience at the 31st Cash uh, in Baghdad. Uh, the year I was there, to kind of give uh, background uh, to uh, pediatric resuscitation of uh, traumatic hemorrhagic shock or blood failure. And, um, you know, I, I've always had the title on my slide for this talk, um, Why Did the Army Send a Pediatric Doctor to, to War? No matter how many times after I came back in 05, people said to me, well, they, the Army deployed you? And you're a baby doctor. What good could you have been? Was basically what they were saying. And I get it. But if, but if you think about it, uh, how old are our soldiers? They're 18, 19, 20, 21. They're basically adolescents, right? And pediatric trained uh, physicians and definitely pediatric critical care or cardiology, pulmonology, are, are very good at taking care of uh, pediatric uh, critical illness, traumatic uh, hemorrhage, et cetera. And actually, I think we're better at dealing with the adolescent um, stresses uh, that occurred in theater. I can't tell you how many soldiers I treated for ADHD that kind of you know, exacerbated with the stress of war, depression, anxiety that I was used to treating as a pediatric trained doctor. So you might not think uh, pediatricians are valuable uh, in war, uh, but actually, uh, I think they were, are. I think that's a very cool picture, too, by the way. All right, so I was stationed uh, in the green zone uh, in Baghdad 0405. I got there April when I told you Fallujah went to hell. Uh, it was interesting when we f uh, fell into the green zone. The green zone, if you remember, some of you were too young to remember. Uh, but the green zone while I was here was uh, on the banks of the Tigris River. We put up what's called Jersey barriers, these 10-foot concrete barriers around uh, the western, northern part of central uh, Baghdad. This is where Hussein had all of his palaces. There were, I think, eight or nine very large, you know, mansion, McMansion-type palaces along the, the river here. He converted this reservoir into an actually swimmable pool uh, for himself and all of his uh, uh, family that lived here. Uh, the cache, the 31st cache, Ibn Sina, uh, was located here. I'll show you some pictures soon. Uh, there, the government headquarters for uh, the uh, Iraqi government were, was here. And I was uh, in charge of a level two aid station just across uh, from uh, the palaces. And at that point in 04, uh, when I got there, Hussein was still, you know, hidden. Uh, I think uh, Uday and Kusay, I think they were dead by that point. But those... Um, monsters actually had a cage of lions outside their palace. And the lions were still there uh, when I got there. And uh, the story from the local Iraqis that we met was that Uday and Kusay would uh, feed uh, their lions with people that they, that they weren't happy with. Uh, just, uh, it was amazing the stories that we had heard from the Iraqis when, when we got there. Uh, and to kind of see the lions there was, you know, like physical proof of their um, sickness. So I got stationed with the 1st Cavalry uh, uh, Division here in the central uh, center of Baghdad. The cache is literally a mile and a half away. I'm seeing no patients, right? And I'm an ICU doctor. I like to get shit done. There's, I'm here for a week going, well, what am I going to do? This is insane. I just got pulled away from my family, my kids, two, four years old. You know, all, this, the, action, all the action is happening a mile and a half away. You know, I, I, I got to get in the fight. So um, how I stayed busy my year in Baghdad was I went to the cash and said, I'm an ICU doc. Yeah, I take care of kids, but I'm just as good as the rest of you. You know, let me, uh, let me take call. So they wound up uh, letting me take call in the ICU. I ran my level two hospital, and eventually, I'll explain to you, I turned it into an overflow ICU 
for the cash. I got involved with the uh, UN, something called the Golden Child Project. I'll explain that. I did evaluations for any kid that saw me, but the CIA started bringing me uh, kids of, uh, of, of high value. We'll talk about that too. I ran the first pediatric advanced life support to, uh, class in Baghdad ever. I kind of you know, gave local pediatricians PALS cards. They were super excited and interested. It was amazing to kind of see how the medical system got uh, uh, decimated uh, in Iraq uh, over that time. Oh, and by the way, I was studying for my boards. <laughs> if you can imagine, as we were getting shelled every other day, I had to take my critical care boards at the end of the year. And we actually clearly got a lot of research done uh, my year there uh, as well. So the 31st uh, Combat Support Hospital uh, was uh, who was within uh, Baghdad at the time. Uh, they called me 24-7 for sick uh, children that came to the cash. And as I mentioned, I wound up staffing the ICU two days a week as well to, have, to help uh, unload the only ICU doc that was covering the ICU at that time. That year, uh, when things really kind of fell, uh, fell apart, uh, when Fallujah um, went on fire, uh, over 3,000 trauma admissions in one year, um, you know, more, close to 1,000 in the ICU. Clearly, penetrating wounds was a predominant uh, mechanism of injury. We took care of coalition soldiers, obviously. We took care of foreign nationals. You'd expect that. But we took t uh, care of a ton of enemy combatants. And I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, how difficult uh, that was. Clearly, the Geneva Convention uh, says we had to treat them uh, equally, and, and we did. We've published it. But it wasn't easy. So here is Ibn Sinem. Uh, this was Saddam Hussein's uh, personal hospital. It was only really for him, his immediate family, and high-level uh, Ba'athist party uh, members. Uh, you can see this was af picture was taken after the Green Zone bombings. You probably don't remember, but in late '04 there were multiple bombs within uh, the Green Zone that killed uh, many, many uh, people. Uh, so we started to barricade the hospital as a result. And we also became so busy that year that we added a wing <laughs> to the third floor uh, where the operating rooms were because we uh, were getting bottlenecked in the operating room. Uh, so now normally for the military people uh, here, you know, when you deploy uh, to combat for a level three uh, combat support hospital, it's called a debt med, a deployable you know, medical uh, aid station. It's basically a tent that's blown up with uh, generators and you're, and you're living in a tent. Uh, this was much cooler than living in a, live, working in a tent when we were getting mortared literally daily. So it was great to be in a fixed uh, facility uh, for that year. So that year, you know, clearly, and many of you, you know, it's been so long since the beginning of the war, you may not um, realize how sick uh, these patients were that we took care of in the combat zone. So I'm just going to give you a sense of what it was like. A ton of extremity injuries, as you can see. You know, as you can imagine, uh, IEDs cause a shitload of trauma uh, and injury. Here, early in the war, right, we didn't have um, sophisticated tourniquets. Early in the war, we had, you know, sticks. Uh, it's, it's crazy what we started out with. Uh, but I showed you this picture already. Not too long after that, we started to get more sophisticated tourniquets uh, in theater that were helpful. We also had a ton of globe injuries our year uh, two. Early on, um, just a ton of, of globe injuries. Here you see you know, shrapnel is not, not a friend to the eye, obviously. And it was really difficult early in the war to make young soldiers, these teenagers, these kids, to wear their protective eye gear. You know why? It didn't look cool. And that was really the reason. So early on, the protective glasses, you know, it's called, they're called birth control glasses for a reason, right? You know, they wouldn't wear them. So we finally had to buy Wiley X, cool looking, uh, to get the soldiers, no matter how many times we would show these pictures to these young kids going, you want to look like this? Put your glasses on. Eh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then they wouldn't. Uh, but uh, interesting. So worse than that uh, were pelvic injuries, right? Uh, you, as you could imagine, IEDs, right, were getting detonated as uh, Humvees were being driven over the IED. So if you're sitting in your vehicle, right, and it blows up from under you, where do you think it's going to hit? 
going to hit your jewels and you get your pelvis. Okay, and this, these injuries were really difficult to take care of because of the, uh, you get colonic injury, it would get infected, and uh, having pelvic infections and uh, abdominal injury or from IEDs, this was common and very difficult to deal with uh, in the ICU. And sometimes you'd, even ha you'd have to do a hemipelvectomy for patients like that. This is uh, uh, our surgeons taking care of a soldier who required a hemipelvectomy. This is a femur, you know, tibia, fibia, and the person, the soldier's foot that was um, excised, removed, uh, due to uh, severe pelvic uh, injury, uh, infection, uh, et cetera. You know, but as I mentioned, we took care of enemy combatants. So this is um, a, an insurgent that we took care of in our ICU. And these guys were not pleasant people. Uh, even after, you know, giving them amazing level care, I mean, they were literally taking their feces and throwing it at the nurses, right? And here were two nurses that had to deal with this shit almost literally every day. And it was hard. So it was very easy to say as a civilian or even as a, you know, a military uh, uh, person, oh, well, the Geneva Convention applies. These guys should get this, uh, a, an adequate level of care. Uh, but it was very difficult to, to do uh, practically. Uh, and then the, the, the nurses wore their nines. Let them kind of know, you know, enough is enough. Don't, uh, don't push it too far. Uh, and then we had the actual IED uh, makers, these bomb makers. We would save their lives. This is a bomb maker whose bomb blew up in his face. And I'm saving his life. Oh, and by the way, to his left is a soldier that got blown up. And to his right might be a child that has multiple injuries from an IED. And, I, and we have to, we, we treated these guys just as equally. We gave them our own whole blood. The whole blood program that I talked about before, right, it was from my arm into a patient. We didn't discriminate. It was difficult, but we did it. Because we kind of know when the person comes in if they're an insurgent or not. And we've published. We gave our own blood in equal amounts and, and proportions to enemy combatants than we did uh, our own soldiers or uh, foreign nationals, coalition soldiers. And you know what? That was, um, I thought, a very good publication. A thousand patients thought it was, um, it was right after Abu Ghraib, which was a black eye for us. And I thought, this should be published in a high-level journal. New England Journal, Lancet, JAMA all d uh, uh, rejected it literally within hours when we submitted it, which was very uh, depressing. Um, I also wound up turning my level two into an overflow uh, ward the year I was there, and we took coalition soldiers, Iraqis, children. Our goal was to open up beds at the, uh, at the cache. In um, September, October of 04, when Fallujah really was going bad, they didn't have enough bed spaces at the 31st cache. So the commander comes to me and says, Phil, I know you have a 40-bed unit a, a mile and a half down the road. Can you start taking some patients over? I said, but sir, I only have one nurse, one PA, one PA, and a bunch of medics who've been sitting around doing nothing because they're in the middle of the green zone. He said, Spinella, figure it out. Uh, so we did. Uh, and we actually took care of a large number of patients in, uh, in six months. And many Iraqi patients stayed uh, for months. Here was one of our first patients that we took care of in, uh, in basically the basement of a Bath Party headquarter building that we tried to convert into uh, a semi-hospital. Uh, this was an Iraqi policeman on the day of his graduation. The insurgents bombed it, uh, and he developed, um, had bilateral femur fractures, bad osteomyelitis, needed a wound vac on his right uh, femur. And in, my, in the basement of the Bath Party headquarters building, we're giving him ketamine and doing you know, wound uh, uh, changes every uh, two, three days with medics who have never taken care of anybody like this uh, before. We also had a lot of the children that were at the cache came uh, to my level two aid station. This is Kuri. Uh, Kuri is a nine-year-old boy. Uh, the Ukrainian army uh, was rolling through his village one day, handing out chocolates to the children. Uh, Kuri makes the mistake of running in front of a tank as they're leaving town, which was a big rut row 
because uh, it caused major pelvic fractures, a com complete degloving injury of his right leg and a severe urethral uh, injury as well. So after the third day after his um, grafting uh, surgery, the commander says, Phil, you need to take Curry at your place. I'm like, sir, I can't take care of this kind of uh, injury in the basement of the Bath Party headquarters building. Spinella figured out. Oh, yes, sir, I'll figure it out. So we did. And we, uh, you can see this is you know, the graft a few days after. Um, and in a room, maybe about the size, that didn't have uh, complete windows, uh, it clearly wasn't sterile, you know, we took care of his uh, lesions. Here's his dad uh, helping him by changing his dressings. Curry's first word in English was morphine. His second was ketamine. But tough kid. Uh, you can see his uh, skin graft, you know, healing pretty well over time, uh, preventing contractions. His father was very um, vigilant about his PT, and if Curry complained about the pain, his father said, suck it up. You know, we got to get it done, and uh, he did. And you can see in a very you know, austere environment, his skin grafts uh, are healing really well. His father now sends me pictures every year, or had been sending me them every year. This was maybe two years after his injury, healing extremely well. Uh, Curry with his brother, maybe th three years after his injury. And now we're Facebook friends. Uh, this is uh, Curry maybe 10 years uh, after his injury, doing extremely well. That was what I took care of at my level, too. I clearly went to the cash and took care of a lot of children, too. This was a child that um, had severe burns and inhalation injury from an IED. Uh, marine medics traked him in the field, very impressive. Uh, and then when he came to us, intubated him and, and took care of him. We saw a lot of kids with penetrating injury, too. When you look on the outside, this might seem like, you know, road rash, something not that serious. But look on the right on his x-ray. There's shrapnel. Pelvis, abdomen, chest, and unfortunately he had shrapnel in his brainstem too. He wound up uh, dying. Uh, we also had kids caught in the crossfire. This was a child that got shot uh, on this side, you know, ex exit wound here. No intracranial hemorrhage, uh, but you can see severe orbital uh, injury. And unfortunately, um, this patient died from an ABO mismatch from getting red cells that were the wrong type for him. Uh, so uh, despite the heroic uh, resuscitation in the field, um, he died from a, an ABO uh, mismatch uh, during a massive transfusion uh, event. Uh, for a lot of burn patients too, this is Mushtaq. Mushtaq is three, three and a half years old. Mother at a, um, at a checkpoint just kind of got nervous and hit the car in front of her. Car catches on fire. Uh, Mushtaq's older brother at eight uh, died of his burn injuries. She died of uh, her burn injuries. And this is uh, him when I helped resuscitate him in the ER uh, when he came in. So circumferential burns in his uh, legs and arms, chest you can see, and severe inhalational injury. In his vocal cords when I intubated him were as dark as his uh, nares. And you can see here he's not very swollen yet. But right after his, 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 his um his uh, initial surgery, you can see how swollen uh, Mushtaq has uh, become from uh, the crystalloids that he received for the, the standard you know, burn resuscitation. Uh, he needed escarotomies in all four extremities for compartment syndrome. Also developed abdominal compartment syndrome. I placed a peritoneal uh, catheter in him just to decompress him. And once we did that, he started to make urine uh, too. So a very uh, difficult resuscitation. When you're in theater, you don't have all the toys you have at home. So for all the anesthesiologists in the, in the crowd that you're used to, your nitric oxide, your oscillator, um, surfactant maybe even, you know. We had uh, PEEP in the prone position, okay? He's on a PEEP of 25 right now, and his PIP is 80. In effing insane, right? You talk to old school blood anesthesiologists, they'll say you had to do that back in the day. But I was not trained to take to use a PIP of 80 and a PIP of 25 with a conventional ventilator and uh, use the prone position. But that's all we had. So you had to just um, 
uh, improvise and do what you could to get uh, your patients uh, through. Um, we extubate Mushtaq about three weeks later, and now he has horrific um, post extubation stridor, right? So what we would do at home, we might try Heliox, uh, um, and there's no Heliox in theater. So we had just, you know, put a ton of effort into him, right? We're not going to lose Mushtaq because of post extubation strider. I said to my commander, I said, the next flight to Germany, I want you to bring back some Heliox. Sir, I don't care. You, know, you, you've had, you made me figure it out. Sir, you figure it out. You know? And at the same time, there was a zoo, actually, in Baghdad. Fair, barely functional, but there were actually, a, it was a zoo there. I went to my um, translator and said to Khaled, I said, Khaled, go to the zoo. Get me Heliox. I care how you do it. Make it happen. So at the same time the zoo uh, helium comes, the, the medical grade helium comes from Germany, we wound up using the medical grade heliox. But then we, we said, oh, shit, we don't have a way to deliver it. There was no, you know, BiPAP system or, or mist tents that we could use. So we had the nurses, you know, uh, figure out how to make a mist tent out of uh, sterile uh, clear uh, plastic from the OR and, you know, wire hangers or wire that they had uh, laying around. There was a ton of improvising that year for children because we d didn't deploy with pediatric uh, equipment. But this worked. And I know some of you smart people in the audience will go, ah, helium is going gonna, gonna to rise. It's not, that, this is bullshit, Phil. I'm telling you, the strider stopped when we gave it, and he uh, survived. He left the hospital about three months later on room air. Uh, even though he had such difficult uh, ARDS after his burn uh, surgery. Uh, not all stories ended well, though. This was another patient with what might seem, you know, not that severe uh, externally. CAT scan, you know, penetrating injury right through his uh, midbrain structures. So we had a lot of children come to the cache, right? They get flown in by helicopter. It's not like home where the parents are a half hour behind, right? You get a kid in the ICU like this, the parents come, you have a difficult conversation, and you uh, withdraw support. We're withdrawing support on uh, two-year-old children with no parents around. It sucked. It was difficult. It um, required a lot of um, tequila and cigars on the, on the roof at nighttime, which was not authorized by the way. But we did it anyway. Uh, some good stories, though. So. On the, the first day of Iraqi uh, elections, January 30th, 2005, many of you might not remember it. I did because we were super nervous that on the elections there was going to be vehicle-borne IEDs everywhere and it was going to be a very bad situation. So as a result, we didn't allow any civilian um, uh, cars to be driven on the roads. We stopped all traffic. Well, this, kid's, uh, this kid didn't get the memo, and his mom went into labor near the Kuwaiti border uh, of, of Iraq. So now, she's in labor. Her plan was to kind of hail a taxi to the local hospital to deliver, but she can't get one now because there's no taxis because we stopped them because of the election. She winds up, finds a private that basically uses charades to, to communicate to him, I'm pregnant, I'm having a baby, I need to get to the hospital. He uh, calls in a Black Hawk to come fly her uh, from the southern border of Iraq up to Ibn Sina. And he can't bring the Black Hawk to a local hospital on the southern border because it would have gotten shot down. It wasn't air superiority there. So he uh, does off the Black Hawk, brings the kid up to Ibn Sina. I get the call on the back phone. Phil, we got a maybe premature baby coming. You know, can you please come to the cache and help us out? The delivery went really well. Uh, the baby did great. You know, we did the whole vitamin K stuff and ne neonatal stuff that I even I had to remember. And I just thought this was a great story. This was the birth of a baby at an uh, Iraqi hospital, you know, with American support um, on the day of the birth of the Iraqi democracy, right? Like, what a great metaphor. No one would pick up the story. It was like, yeah, that's a positive story. We only do negative stories uh, and, you know, keep moving on. That kind of sucked. I also got involved in the Golden Child Project, the uh, UN. 
was getting a lot of calls uh, from Iraqis to have their children, you know, children leave the country. So uh, they wound up hearing about um, me in, in Baghdad. As you can imagine, I'm not a subtle kind of guy. People know I'm around. And uh, they said, hey, will you help us kind of be a gatekeeper, figure out what kids should leave uh, Iraq for medical care and which ones shouldn't. So kids that had um, very simple diseases like EB, you know, high-dose steroids, that'll resolve that, and we treated the kids and kept them in theater. Children like this that need major skin grafting, that couldn't be treated in theater, would be very difficult to do outside of uh, theater. We told them there was nothing to do with that for him, and he just needed to stay. This child came to me, extremely small in abdomen. The history was at birth, he was a dominus at his feet, and it kind of marched up his body. He's about three or four months old here. And this just looked like lymphangiomatosis. I had never seen it before, but it just, it just smelled like it. So just took a needle in his abdomen and pulled out literally that day about 800 mLs of chylus uh, fluid from his, from his abdomen and decompressed it. You can see here how his belly uh, is a much uh, more decompressed compared to the first uh, picture. Um, the only way to medically treat this is with alpha interferon. There is zero way I was going to get that uh, in theater. So I just tapped his belly every month. I taught a family practice doctor how to do it when I left. And you can see the Kyle there. And I don't know what happened to him, but we did our best. Um, so this is a great story. This is Lamia. She's a 14-year-old girl that has a big belly, right? Uh, she was from the southern border of Iraq, too. The local doctors there just presumed she was in hepatic uh, failure. This was all ascites. And they tapped her belly every month. Um, because she wasn't uh, from a rich family, she didn't have access to medical care in Iraq for her 14 years of life and um, was never imaged to see what was in her abdomen. So the, um, the unit that, was take, that, was, that found her brought her up to me just to figure out should she leave or not? The, the unit was actually from Boston. Their plan was to send her to Boston Children's to get evaluated. So we put her in the scanner, and she has this extremely large cystic uh, mass in her belly. I mean, look at this. Her liver is basically two centimeters, like right below her diaphragm. I mean, her, col her, her intestines are all basically in her pelvis. This was um, a very impressive uh, CAT scan finding, but talking to the surgeons, and we luckily had an oncologic surgeon who played with us that year. Uh, Tommy says to me, oh, this is easily surgically resectable. I'm like, great, we'll send her to Boston. They'll do it there, and you know, she'll go home. And Tommy's like, oh, no, man, I want to do this. I'm like, dude, you're insane. I'm like, we don't have pediatric nurses, don't have pediatric anesthesia. He's like, yeah, you got juice, Vanilla, figure it out. So what are you going to do, right? He's fine, we'll, we'll figure it out. Here's Lamia, pre-op, right? I mean, this... This tumor is, is huge. Um, she was, I think she was 80 pounds pre-op, 40 pounds post-op. We took out a, you know, this, this, 20, uh, this 40 pound tumor from her belly. And this is actually smaller than it really was. Some of these cysts popped as the surgeons wrestled it out of her uh, abdomen. The pathology was an advanced polycystic liver disease uh, that could have been resected when she was one, but because she was in a country where it had, uh, that had minimal medical care for anybody who wasn't uh, a Bathist. She, uh, this is what it uh, progressed to. Pretty interesting. I also wound up doing ad hoc, ad hoc child evaluations. I want to make it clear. No matter who the child was, I had the, the, the janitor in my aid station. She brought her child to me. I took care of her child. But the CIA also would bring me uh, children of um, important uh, shakes from Fallujah now and then, uh, just as well. And, you know, they did it to help build trust and take care of the people that they were trying to win hearts and minds of. So I wound up uh, getting a phone call about this uh, child who had meningitis, was being treated at the university hospital, and the only antibiotic they had there at that point was chloramphenicol, right? And, that's, and this is 2005. And the shake is going... My kid's going to die. I mean, this is, I, I need, will you help me? Can you get my kid to an American doctor? So the, uh, the CIA guys found me. They brought me uh, the Sheikh's child. Uh, we gave the child, Rosefin vancomycin, the meningitis melts away. 
This is him on a two-month kind of follow-up with me uh, in my, my aid station. And he was completely uh, normal. No cognitive or neurologic deficits uh, at all. On the way walking out of the aid station, the CAA guy says to me, hey, Phil, thanks a ton for taking care of the kid. I said, of course. I mean, I would do it for anybody. He's like, no, after you started antibiotics on this kid, the Sheikh gave up 200 insurgents in a warehouse up in Fallujah. They're all in Guantanamo now. I said, huh, the ultimate in preventive medicine. No, for real, and, and I tried to operationalize this. I said to my commanders, we need to let the CAA people know kind of where the pediatricians are because this is going to help us gain trust. I got told, hell no, Spinella, we can't do that. Think how that's going to be spun by the other side, uh, that we're uh, you know, leveraging medical care for information. I said, but we're not. The Spinella doesn't matter. It's going to look bad. But well, unfortunately, we never did anything more uh, than that. Extremely uh, frustrating. Now, this year for me was extremely rewarding uh, and stimulating, but at the same time, man, it would make me angry. So in October 04, me and the five other guys that were with me kind of had an enlightenment. You know, we realized that we were doing something that was very different at the cash. We were using whole blood. Um, at that point, factor 7A, tourniquets we promoted, hypothermia, the treatment. And we uh, decided we needed to develop a database to study what we were doing. We realized we were doing something special that, that needed to be uh, documented. So we had one of the hematologists that used to work in the ICU, and we said to Jeremy, you know, Jeremy, go through 3,000 charts and pull out literally 1,000 data points per patient. You don't have to do any more clinical care. I'll take your calls. But we got to document what we're doing. And from that database was all the initial studies that all came out. All the ratio stuff, the factor 7A stuff, whole blood stuff came from the six of us going, we're doing something special here, and we have to document it. We also wound up publishing a lot of our pediatric um, experience, uh, too. That led to a telemedicine service providing 24-7 coverage uh, for children. Uh, but what it really did for me, right, was say, man, we, gotta, we can't accept, what did I just say before? You know, accepting mediocrity is unacceptable, right? That was what I felt back then. We cannot accept uh, the status quo. We have to do something better for patients with, with hemorrhagic uh, shock. That's where the whole concept of damage control resuscitation came from. John Holcomb at that point, and still is, is a very important mentor for me. And John and I and many others uh, did a lot of the initial uh, publications on uh, DCR. Uh, but what's, here's what's interesting, and I think it's important to kind of tell the story of how things happen. We published ratio stuff, but no one has ever really asked, where did that come from? Right before 2005, none of us ever spoke about ratios when it came to resuscitation. Right? It was all hemoglobin-based, INR-based, platelet count-based. And there was no talk in 405 about ratios. This is how it happened. This guy, Robert Little, from Baltimore, writes a scathing article about our use of factor 7A in theater, basically accusing us of being in uh, Nova Nordisk's pocket and making money and killing soldiers. You can imagine. You can tell I'm a bit passionate about this stuff. I come home from theater. I got this puke from Baltimore accusing me of being uh, 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 in the back pocket of a, of a drug company. It made me go insane. So that night, I went into our database that I just told you about, and I went to see if factor 7A was associated with outcomes or not. Um, as I'm doing the analysis, red cell use and plasma use were both associated with mortality. So when, they, so when you want to do a uh, logistic regression to adjust for confounding, and you have two variables that are associated with your outcome, and you don't want to eliminate any one of them, what do they teach you? Make a ratio out of it. But make a ratio out of plasma and red cells. And OMG. It comes up being incredibly associated with improved survival. So if it wasn't for this guy at the Baltimore Sun, we never would have published this initial ratio paper. And the whole concept of, of DCR was really predicated 
upon you know a, a, a hemostatic resuscitation, a whole blood uh, uh, approach, and uh, it's um, it's you know it always makes me um, remember how you know this all started, and it's just sometimes things happen, and uh, it's uh, and if it wasn't for that article, who knows where we would be at, at this point. Um, so what about the kids? Is what I'm supposed to be talking about. 10,000 kids per year in the U.S. die uh, from trauma. 2,000 of them have preventable deaths from hemorrhage. Okay, this is way too many kids dying per year in the U.S. due to traumatic hemorrhage. That's preventable. Uh, in the study that I'm completing now, the mortality of children, this is an international study, is 40% with children with tra traumatic, uh, life-threatening hemorrhage. It's close to double what it is in adults. Uh, another study done a little bit while ago uh, also had similar findings. Mortality for children with traumatic hemorrhage, 50%. So why are is, why is our outcomes so bad uh, in children? Children are supposed to be more resilient, right? So I think it's because in pediatric hospitals, we don't have the volume to maintain competency in treating children with, with massive hemorrhage, and we are, are, are under-resuscitating uh, them. That's my hypothesis at the moment. So what do we do about children with massive bleeding? Well, the first thing we need to do as well is the response to traumatic hemorrhage uh, similar to adults. And it is. It's actually quite interesting. About, you know, 25, 33% of children with severe injury are coagulopathic or shock or in shock based upon INR or base deficit. And clearly, uh, the mortality uh, effect is, dr is dramatic for patients that show up with an INR above 1.5, base deficit above Six, and this is super similar to what was presented by Brohe uh, and others back in 2003. So children have a similar uh, response uh, or blood failure. Uh, we did uh, a study trying to uh, assess how we can predict uh, mortality uh, for children with traumatic bleeding. The base deficit, the INR and, and GCS, uh, really performed extremely well to predict outcomes for children with uh, traumatic uh, injury. You can see here if they were in, if they were coagulopathic, two times the risk of hemorrhage, of uh, mortality. They were in shock, three times the risk of, of mortality. And if they had both coagulopathy and shock, a four times increased risk of mortality. So children are acting similar uh, to adults when it comes to the development of shock, coagulopathy, and the, and the uh, association with outcomes. Um, other than another group from Pittsburgh has also been studying the coagulopathy of trauma in children. They're finding also similar results that children have fibrinolytic dysregulation that's associated with mortality and DVT as well too. So children, the response to traumatic injury seems to be the same. Just to give you an example of what a pediatric massive transfusion protocol looks like at my institution, if they're less than 30 uh, per kilo, they're getting uh, one to one to one right now with uh, plasma platelets and red cells, uh, and same above 30, just different units. Um, you might say, well, geez, Phil, why aren't you giving whole blood for children at your children's hospital? I'm trying, uh, but culture change is not easy, and our volume isn't big enough uh, uh, to easily support uh, incorporating whole blood, but I'm trying. Are we getting there? So what about empiric, uh, you know, ratios uh, for children? There's clearly no high-quality evidence to guide uh, that practice, but we did do a survey not too long ago, uh, seeing, well, what do people's policies uh, indicate that they're what they're trying to achieve? And you can see that, you know, the, vast, the majority of uh, 50 uh, children's hospitals in the U.S. are 73% uh, of them are trying to get a higher ratio of plasma to red cells, but only half are trying to get a higher ratio platelets uh, to red cells. And that's maybe not that surprising because the evidence really isn't there to support it. What about antifibrinolytics uh, in children? There's no great evidence to support its use, uh, but uh, if you uh, are going to use it, I think it's reasonable to use it within three hours of injury, and the dose of TXA is 15 mg per kg IV. It was also interesting, too, as a pediatric ICU doc to kind of look at adult practice and then look at pediatric practice. It makes sense to, to dose any drug according to the patient's weight due to pharmacokinetics, dynamics, et cetera. Why do we give all adults one gram of TXA? You can have a 
female soldier or casualty who's 55 kilos, she gets one gram. You know, you have a 300-pound uh, male, six foot five, who gets one gram of TXA. It it's, doesn't make sense. We should be dosing TXA in adults according to uh, their ideal weight as well. One study in children, though, showing that it might be a mortality benefit of uh, TXA from uh, combat casualty, ch children treated at combat support hospitals uh, that were kind of caught in the crossfire. I will, in all uh, admission, it's a weak study, uh, but some potential evidence that it might be beneficial in children too. What about fibrinogen versus cryo? Uh, that's a big debate. Maybe we can talk more about that during the panel session. You know, the benefits of fibrinogen concentrates are that it's a, it's, there's no risk of infection. You can give uh, multiple grams of fibrinogen at a time, and it's quick, relatively. Uh, cryo needs to be thawed. Uh, it might have a very small risk of infection. But with cryo, you do get a factor 8, 13, and von Willebrand's. And these are important hemostatic factors, uh, too. So this is um, an unresolved debate in children. I think it's an unresolved debate in adults as well. Uh, but I do think when uh, you give a source of fibrinogen, it probably should be uh, goal-directed, whether it's uh, Rotem or TEG, or even based upon the fibrinogen concentration. PCCs, I think there's a less of an indication. In children, there's very little children that are on Coumadin. And again, if you're going to give it, maybe it should be goal-directed. Factor 7A has uh, fallen uh, to the wayside due to the potential concern for uh, safety. But again, when we gave it, it was not goal-directed. And I think we've lost drug that could have been helpful if we were giving it in a goal-directed fashion, uh, but we weren't. The trials were, were, were negative due to fertility, and it's basically stopped uh, being used. Um, I mentioned this, this Matic study uh, that we're completing now. I'm going to show you results from close to 500 children that had any cause uh, of massive bleeding. You can see here about 40% trauma, 40% bleeding, 20% medical bleeding, and uh, it's disconcerting how long it takes to get components to these children who need an MTP. A median of 10 minutes, even with group O, group, um, group uh, I'm sorry, O negative red cells that are available in uh, refrigerators, still takes 10 minutes to get to uh, these children. Plasma, it's taking 30 minutes, and platelets, 42 minutes. Platelets should be immediately available. They don't need to be uh, thawed. It just, uh, I think people are giving platelets last in the resuscitation, and there are many of us that think that maybe you should be given first. Um, you know, how long do MTPs take in children? This is very eye-opening to me, too. A good three hours plus for uh, the duration of an MTP. So these things last for a very uh, long time in children. Interestingly, this kind of study has not been done in adults. Um, it would be interesting to see how long adult MTPs uh, last. And right now, all we have are mortality data for these children requiring massive transfusion. The mortality here, as I mentioned before, 40%. Medical bleeding, 60%. And operative bleeding, uh, 30%. So I think we're underperforming uh, in children when it comes to uh, those that are massively bleeding. Um, I, I, I'm supportive of a goal-directed hemostatic resuscitation approach, whether it's TEG or Rotem. I'm going to go through these uh, quickly. Because you know it, but you know, we've known now for 10, 20 years, hemostasis is cell-based. It's called a cell-based model of hemostasis. So if it's if it's cell-based, you know, why are we using coagulation parameters that are not cell-based? When you send a PT, PT, T, I, and R at your institution, it's a plasma-based sample. It excludes platelets, red cells, and, and white cells that actually all contribute to hemostasis. Um, I'm just trying to get through this quickly. We know all this. Um, but yeah, there are Cochrane reviews showing when you use viscoelastic measures for patients with, with, with bleeding, is actually, it, it has been associated with reduced mortality, uh, reduced exposure to blood products, uh, which is important. Uh, you only need, should get what you need, even if you're bleeding. Also reduces renal failure, uh, too. So there's, I think, better evidence that we should be using viscoelastic testing to guide our hemostatic uh, resuscitation. Uh, here's a single center study out of Denver showing when TEG was used versus not improved survival in traumatic uh, injured patients. 
and I'll go through that quickly. Uh, I'm going to skip it. So that's just, you know, our approach uh, for hem hemostatic resuscitation in children. It basically mirrors what we do uh, in adults until we have evidence to show that we, uh, we shouldn't. Um, talked to you before about the Thor uh, network. Here's our website uh, where we have a lot of information and uh, publications. If you're interested in, in joining our network and coming to our meetings and getting involved in the network, let Gare or I uh, know. And you can get in contact with us through the website if um, you don't get in touch with us here today. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm done. <laughs>